So I was up way too late the other night thinking about Train's 2001 hit, Drops of Jupiter. These days it's the sort of song you're most likely to hear echoing across grocery stores, empty malls, or really anywhere that thinks inoffensive soft rock might lull consumers into enough of a daze to buy things. It's a song that's so quintessentially early 2000s, a cocktail of crisp production, melodramatic piano, beautiful string arrangements, and kind of... Awkward lyrics, like can you imagine no first dance freeze-dried romance, five-hour phone conversation, the best soy latte that you ever had, and me. And it's all sung by a guy who looks like this. If you weren't there when Drops of Jupiter blew up, you could be forgiven for kind of overlooking it as a piece of music. But when it first came out, it was an absolute sensation. Taking the music world by storm and launching Train from obscurity into a moment of soft rock superstardom. The song hit number 5 on the Billboard Hot 100 and cracked the top 10 in 7 other countries. It would go on to be certified 8 times platinum in the US, and it pulled in 5 nominations at the 44th Grammy Awards, including the prestigious Record of the Year and Song of the Year. It ended up losing out on those to U2 and Alicia Keys, but Train walked home with wins for Best Rock Song and Best Instrumental Arrangement Accompanying Vocalists. An era of lush soft rock was emerging, and Train seemed to be a band at the right place at the right time. Only, nothing really came of it. Their follow-up single to Drops of Jupiter, She's on Fire, was a laid-back, rootsy love song that didn't really resonate with audiences like Drops of Jupiter did, though it was featured in the soundtrack to the Rugrats Wild Thornberrys crossover movie Rugrats Go Wild, so that's... something? I guess? Over the next few years, Train would score a few more minor hits, but the band themselves were going through turmoil. Founding member and lead guitarist Rob Hotchkiss left the band due to creative differences, and bassist Charlie Collin was kicked out because of substance abuse issues. Collin, by the way, tragically passed at 58 years old just a few months ago. Train wouldn't crack the mainstream again until 2009, when they dropped Hey Soul Sister right in the middle of the music world's brief love affair with ukuleles and fedoras. That song outperformed even Drops of Jupiter and cemented Train in the minds of many, myself included, as a two-hit wonder, with songs that sort of perfectly bookend the era of 2000s pop rock. Maybe it's because I came of age during that strange moment and heard Hey Soul Sister way too many times, or maybe I'm just a hater, but I had never really taken Train seriously as a band. And that's why Drops of Jupiter always kind of baffled me. Because on the one hand, it's a song that I always associated with a sort of ironic nostalgia. I'd sang along to it many times while internally poking fun at lines like, Can you imagine no love, pride, deep fried chicken? And she checks out Mozart while she does Tai Bo, reminds me that there's room to grow. But on the other hand, I think it is a song that has a truly beautiful conceit, and more than a few moments of genuine profundity. And honestly, even with its odd 2001-isms, I think it's a song that has generally stood the test of time. So as I lay awake the other night turning over these sorts of contradictions, I resolved to look into the song in the morning because I didn't actually know the story behind it. And learning that story not only gave me a deeper appreciation of the song, but it honestly taught me a thing or two about my own biases, and it helped to remind me why I hold the philosophy that I do when it comes to listening to music. Let's take a closer look. This video is made possible by Brilliant. Check out the link in the description for a free 30-day trial and 20% off an annual subscription. Having never done a close reading of it before, I always assumed that Drops of Jupiter was a love song, telling the story of a one-time fling who returns home from finding herself. And honestly, I think that's a reasonable assumption. Just look at the opening stanza. Now that she's back in the atmosphere with drops of Jupiter in her hair, she acts like summer and walks like rain, reminds me that there's time to change. It would seem to be about a woman coming back from abroad as a changed person, and a man who still finds himself entranced by her. This is underlined by a second verse. Now that she's back from that soul vacation tracing her way through the constellation, Soul vacation always seemed to me like a phrase for a sort of eat, pray, love, find yourself journey that the song's subject went through. 
Within this context, I always loved the cosmic imagery that colors the song. Did you sail across the sun? Did you make it to the Milky Way to see the lights all faded and that heaven is overrated? I'm a sucker for romance, and I think there is something cosmically profound about love, so it seemed like fitting imagery. Where I struggled was with some of the clunkier imagery, especially within the context of a love song. She checks out Mozart while she does Taibo, reminds me that there's room to grow, felt a little manic pixie dream girl to me. In case you're somehow unfamiliar with that archetype, the archetype of the manic pixie dream girl is used to describe a certain sort of characterization of women in media, often film and TV. It was the film critic Nathan Rabin that invented the term in a piece for the AV Club, describing the type as an over-the-top quirky woman who exists to teach broodingly soulful men to embrace life and its infinite mysteries and adventures. And while the trope was named years after Drops of Jupiter came out, it existed long before being named, and it was especially prevalent in the culture of the early 2000s. Through this lens, Train's descriptions of this woman rubbed me the wrong way a little, and nudged me toward my more ironic perspective on the song. I would often think that this was a piece with moments of true poetic beauty bogged down by some of the cliches and aesthetic affectations of its era, and that approach led me to not really appreciating the song like I might have. It wasn't that I disliked it, I would bob my head to it any time I heard it in a grocery store and even listen to it on my own every now and then, but I had a hard time truly engaging with the song and taking it at face value. I would chuckle at how quintessentially 2001 it all was, and sing along because of the nostalgia it gave me, but never seriously engage with it as a piece of music. And because of that, I missed a whole lot about the song. If you're a Train fan, or a fan of this song, or maybe if you've just seen the Pop Song Professor's video on this, you've probably been waiting for the other shoe to drop for about five minutes now. Because Drops of Jupiter didn't start its life as a love song. It was actually inspired by frontman Pat Monahan's mother, who had recently died from lung cancer. Monahan told Billboard that the concept first came to him in a dream, and that he wrote it down from there. The song felt like she was writing it, because she was telling me, this is what happens after life. You can do anything you want, swim through planets, and she came back with drops of Jupiter in her hair. It was a way of easing my mind that it wasn't a bad thing. Within this new context, the lyrics take on a whole new meaning for me. Did you make it back to the Milky Way to see the lights all faded, and that heaven is overrated, is a particularly powerful and profound image, that of Monaghan's mother's incorporeal soul exploring the cosmos, getting a whiff of paradise, and still deciding to return home to her son. Lines like soul vacation take on whole new meanings with this. As the pop song professor points out, some of the lines about this woman helping him grow feel a lot less manic pixie dream girl when we learn the context that this woman might be his mother, because what are mothers there for if not to help us grow and learn more about ourselves and the universe? As for the more awkward lyrics, while I still don't love them with this context, I think it adds more charm to them as they're reminders of the small pleasures in life that one might miss when they're gone. In that same Billboard interview, Monaghan addresses some of the odder lyrics, admitting that many were reticent to include them. When I was singing it and people were asking me to change the lyrics, I said, well, why don't you tell me what lyric to sing and I'll try it? And they were like, well, that's kind of your job. Well, then I'm going to sing what I wrote. When you guys come up with something better, I'll sing that. And no one ever did. I still don't love the lyrics, but damn if I don't respect a songwriter sticking to their guns, especially with a song so personal to them. The impulse upon hearing all of this might be to say, oh, this isn't a love song, it's actually about Monaghan's mother, and that's not strictly wrong, but I think that sort of idea that songs can only be about one thing flattens our experience of them. One of the beauties of songwriting as a medium is that songs don't need to be strictly about one thing. There's an abstract emotionality to songs that allows them to occupy multiple spaces simultaneously, because even Monaghan admits Drops of Jupiter is still that same love song. He explained to American Songwriter, I turned it into a love song because that's what people wanted to hear, and that's what I wanted to hear too. I needed it. 
There are so many songs about real things, but we as artists have to make them appealing to the listener. It's like a movie. You have to figure out how to get people to care about it. By wrapping up his own deeply personal experience into a more universally relatable love song, Monaghan created a piece of art that could resonate with people around the world, regardless of their own personal interpretations. Those interpretations that we bring to songs are such an important part of the experience of being a music fan. And that's why I regret my previous approach to Drops of Jupiter. Appreciating music can be a deeply vulnerable act. The songs that resonate with us tell a story about who we are, and can seem to reveal personal things about us to others. And in public spaces, especially online spaces, that sort of vulnerability can be terrifying. So I think that people will sometimes put forth irony as a defense mechanism. It allows us to say, yeah, I like this song, but not really. It helps us feel safer sharing our love, but that same irony also taints the experience of listening to music. Because songs take on the meanings that we bring to them. So if we say, I like this song, but it's kind of stupid to like, then that will inevitably flavor our experience of the song, and it could even impact our own vision of ourselves. It's why my personal philosophy when it comes to approaching music, and really when it comes to approaching any art, is that there's not really such a thing as bad art. The purpose of art is to find meaning for the creator and the audience. The diversity of the human experience means that meaning can come from all sorts of places, and means that all sorts of different art can resonate with different audiences. I genuinely believe that given the right context, people can learn to like almost anything. That's one of the guiding principles of my channel. But often, even without realizing it, I get sucked back into that defensive, ironic response. And that's fully what happened to me with Drops of Jupiter. This is a song that has resonated with me since I was a kid, and clearly a song that's resonated with a lot of people. It's a song with a ton of heart behind it, and a song that's deeply meaningful to its creator. But rather than take that at face value and appreciate it earnestly, my mind had to wrap it up in all these strange, ironic justifications. Now, it could be that I'm just too online, or I think about other people's opinions too much, and maybe this isn't relatable to you, but I suspect there's others who've felt this way about songs that they love. Hell, there's probably others that have felt this way about Drops of Jupiter. So yeah, it's okay and even good, actually, to like the music that you like. Hot take. And Drops of Jupiter is actually a really special song, and... and you know, I'm glad I went on this little journey because it was a good reminder of how easy it is to get bogged down by irony and the weight of our own self-conscious impulses. And I think that's a reminder that we all could use from time to time. Another thing that we could all use from time to time is a new skill to learn. Whether it's coding, engineering, data analysis, there's so much out there to learn that can help you improve both personally and professionally. And the best place to learn all these things is Brilliant.org. Brilliant is a hands-on learning site with thousands of lessons on all sorts of STEM topics. These lessons have been crafted by an award-winning team of teachers, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Caltech, Duke, Microsoft, Google, and more. If you're looking for a place to start, why not try out their course on creative coding, which will help you step up your code game a little. These lessons will help you build critical thinking skills through problem solving, not just memorizing. They teach real knowledge in just a few minutes every day with fun lessons that you can fit in whenever you have the time. I love how simple, clean, and interactive their whole interface is. It just it makes learning really easy. If this sounds like something you might want to check out, you can get started free of cost by going to brilliant.org slash polyphonic. Following that link will get you 30 days free, and after that you'll get 20% off an annual subscription. Checking out that link also does a ton to help support my channel, so thank you. And hey, thanks for watching.